everybody, we are here at Design Miami. It's one of my favorite events of the year. I'm here religiously every December. And I would like to welcome to my curated tour where I'm going to host a couple of very notable architects and interior designers who are going to share with us their passion about objects and what it means to be living with collectible design. So, welcome. Welcome to Design Miami. Um, and I also want to say something to the five of you that I very much praise the fact that you are taking the program Architecture the Legends because it's not very easy and I'm aware of it. You are like, you have to step out of your comfort zone and to really understand what it means to build and to understand the built fabric of today. So thank you for supporting us. And what I'm going to do today in celebrating our program Architecture of the Legends, I'm going to host nine architects. Some of them are interior designers and they are going to share with us one object that they love and they're going to explain to us why. But it's also about, and you know that I'm a very like, I'm a promoter of living with collectible design. It means a lot to me. I really feel that it can transform you know, the way that people live and their life. And we are going to look at this because you're going to walk into this fair and it's filled with objects. And how can we really um, distinguish between what is great and what is mediocre? And that's why we are here. So let's start. I'm Jen Roberts. I'm the CEO of Design Miami. And I selected this 1953 desk by Charlotte Perriand and Pierre Jean -Aure. Hi, Jen. I know your taste, and it looks so much like you. It has this sense of modernism, simplicity, but it also has a really interesting story. It does indeed have an interesting story. Uh, Charlotte Perriand and Pierre Jean Array were collaborating a lot in the 50s during the rebuilding in France. And um, this is one of the desks that they've designed together. But what I love the most about it is the simplicity in the form and the use of the wood in the way that the decorative elements are the grain and the architectural features of the legs and the drawers. And I think that's really what speaks to me. But also what's interesting is that it went into production. It was not like that's a right. bespoke piece. That's right. So it was a period of time where, um, where the concept behind modernism was to make uh, these pieces available to all. And yet, while this went into production, it was still handmade, and that's what makes it so significant. So do you know how many were made? Nope, no idea. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But it was made in the 50s, and it's very much in the spirit of mid-century modernism in France, particularly yes. in France. Yes. So there is something yes. very, like, distinctive about yes. French mid-century design. Yes. What do you think it is? I think it's it's definitely the simplicity in the form. There's an architectural element to about, but it's about the the simplicity of the materials most of all, and um, and that's obviously exemplified here. And we can see the the wood is not treated at all, right? Right. right. So it's the grain, and in this particular piece, you can see the patina. You can see the darkening from the hands and the use, and um, and it's just a, a really lovely proportion. Uh, that would fit into a home at that time. And also, do you think it's like female oriented or do you think it's a unisex? Because you know that Charlotte Perrion, one of her innovations long before she did this, yeah. was that she really invented the idea of unisex. So it's not like before that, before the 20s, you had furniture for men and furniture for women. And she really did that. She's very, she can be credited for that. So what do you think about this? I think this would be unisex. Yeah, for both. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. I'm Bill Sofield, from Studio Sofield. I've chosen Harmonix. I don't know if you had a chance to see the, the television series, the Furniture Design Competition by Ellen DeGeneres. Has anybody seen it in HBO? Mark was the one who won the contest, and now he's 
showing the whole booth at Christina Grahalish. So Bill, you know, you live in a very special house that was designed by Edward Wellstone in Westchester. And, Don and Donald Esky did the interiors. Exactly. Yes. And when you told me that this is your piece, I was not surprised and I tell you why, because Donald Dusky famously for this house that was designed in the 30s, the first modernist house in New York State was designed by Don, the, the furniture was designed by Donald Dusky very much in that spirit. It was indeed. It was actually, the, the, the piece that I'm referring to um, was really the beginning of this of this industrial, and he considered it not Art Deco, but industrial modern. And it was really celebrating industry in and of itself. And the piece dates to 1928. We were, we were looking at it earlier, and so when I saw this, it just seemed like the culmination. Our, you know, our, our design studio, been doing it for 30 years, really tries to blur the lines between architecture, fine art, interior design, and this to me did it. Uh, just before the broadcast, it had a top, but we thought it, it was better to see it in it's its for, for sculptural the video. form. For, yes, but there just, is, there just, is like a yes. glass top on this. Before this the video, just... we just saw with the reflections, it would it would really celebrate it better with the with showing it like this. And just the craftsmanship alone that goes into making a piece like this, deceivingly <laughs> deceivingly simple. But it's we were we were speaking before Very just good. about how beautifully beautifully it crafted and as you know that's that's and, and mark I can about. i ask you you know i read that one of the reasons that you went to the competition was to demonstrate to uh black artists that it is possible to be there to win can you say about where you grew up and how did you get to this um i grew up in ohio with my family, uh, my mother, my father, and my sister. My father is a trained woodworker also. Um, so this is where I, all, all of my background as a creative came from. He used to paint murals around Cleveland. He had a wood shop in the basement of our home. Um, so my family was always very supportive um, in terms of me being a creative and me going to art school. You know, this is not a very, this is not a casual thing. It's not a normal thing for uh, my community to experience. So, but because of the support from my family as a creative, this has all been very possible. And for those who took <laughs> the class last semester with Bridget Romanek, she was one of the judges. She was. So, Bill, do you see, how do you see people live with this? Where do you, as, as an interior designer? Well, again, it's, it's a piece of sculpture and uh, I love the complexity. I love the minimalism. <laughs> so, uh, for me, every everything you should have should be a work of art. I don't really again. I I don't really see decorative arts and fine arts differently, or architecture and, and fine arts differently. It all should be part of this part of the same construct. And uh, I can't imagine not being able to live with it. And it's beautiful. Good luck to you, Mark. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Renee Gonzalez. I'm an architect based in Miami, and I've selected this small side table by Vincenzo De Cotis at Carpenter's Workshop Gallery. Hi, Renee. You selected hey. this gem by Vincenzo De Cotis. He's an Italian architect, and one of the things that I love about his work is how contemporary it is because he has not only with the forms, but also with the way he's using materials. He definitely, I think, loves to explore and experiment with materials, with recycled materials, and with a variety of materials that sometimes don't necessarily work together, which means he's an alchemist. He's working in a very experimental way. And that's one of the things I really love about his work. I also uh, love the materiality of the work because it becomes very tactile and experiential. And that's something that I explore in my own work and as a result relate very much with him in. So he uses a lot of uh, reclaimed materials. What are the materials? Uh, metals uh, combined with recycled. It makes his work very contemporary this way because he's responding to issues that related to environmental issues and materiality and things like that. Yeah, I, I don't know if he sets out intentionally to do that, but I think that his work is 
definitely contemporary. It's definitely beautiful, which I think uh, collectible work for me is uh, a very interesting uh, sort of conversation to have, right? Because something can be collectible and, in my opinion, be not very beautiful uh, because they went through a, a process of experimentation, which is amazing. It's wonderful that a designer would do that. But in the end, what's produced uh, is not beautiful. Now, beautiful is a whole nother loaded word, right? Because it could be very subjective. But I think that once you go through a peer review process, you go through criticones like me and you that <clears throat> establish you as a designer of a, of a certain uh, status, uh, then you and I can argue whether you think that's beautiful or not, right? But and I, I think this is absolutely beautiful. Uh, I think this is absolutely beautiful, but also the other thing, you are an architect, and we talk a lot about architecture this season, and that shows that the mind behind this piece is an architecture mind. A hundred percent. I think uh, Vincenzo understands structure, he understands uh, form, and he understands balance. Like all of his pieces, you will find that there's nothing symmetrical about them. Like they, they, they tend to be supported oftentimes in an asymmetrical fashion. Uh, he, he finds balance through, and he finds perfection through the imperfection of the piece by working on it uh, with his hands. And, and that's a very beautiful thing. That's, and look how this, you would think that it's not balanced when you look at the form, right? But you can almost sit on it. You can almost sit on the cantilever. Well, sit. You are, I think you should sit. Okay, I'll sit. <laughs> okay, thank you, Rene. I'm Tony Ingrau. I'm an architect in New York. And I selected this beautiful chandelier by Katie Stout. Tony, I have to tell you, when I first saw this chandelier in picture, I wasn't very moved. But then when I came and see it in person, it's exquisite. It's like a jewel and it's very much you. Why did you select it? Well, I selected this for multiple reasons. Let's talk about the art first and then I'll talk about the artist. So the art of this chandelier in cast bronze and amazing glass because Katie was a furniture student at RISD and I also went to RISD. She's just in her mid thirties. And I'm a little How old. How old is she? Uh, 34, I think. Okay. And what's beautiful about this piece is that it's, it's breaking up what we consider very traditional pieces of art. So it's like, imagine um, amazing Marjorie pieces from the 20s and amazing Lalique influences and amazing Murano influences. But let's play, let's take it to the next level. Let's talk about it being today. And if you notice, there's a big trend to breaking up forms and not making everything so serious all of a sudden. So we're, we're, we're trying to find new ways of interpreting nature. Well, I also, nature is really important. And I really love the fact that she's taking amazing forms in nature. Like, look at this cord cup. I it's know, fantasy. this is a corn cup. Isn't it incredible? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all fantasy fun, but it actually has a function. And it, it, it works so well. And it, it's ne you never get tired of looking at it. It's, it's not static. You know, there's, it's so handcrafted, that it, and the textures and the softness, and each petal is made in a different way. I just think it's beautiful. And, and I want to say something. This is the first piece that I see of Katie working with bronze. It's nice, she's right? She's very much about materiality. Yes. But I've seen her work before in clay. In the ceramics, And yeah. ceramics, and also in papier mache. Exactly. And to see how she translates her language and her ideas to different material, I think to me it's very fresh. Well, and what's interesting about this of where you're going with that is her work bef until this point was a little more dense and now it's breaking out of the shell and it's light and it's exploding and it's really beautiful. And to me it's also a demonstration on why with design you can't understand design in photography. <laughs> you have to really experience it. This is gorgeous. Yeah. And you can feel the hand which I really really love about that. You know, 
right now, we're in a period where people want to know that something's being made custom by hand and unique. And that's what this piece does. And you, with your interiors, you do a lot of bespoke yeah. and handcrafted pieces. And that's something that I think very much came to define your taste. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Thank you. So nice to see you, Danielle. Hi, I'm Lee Mandel, Chair of the Vetting Committee of Design Miami. I'm an architect. It's my honor to be here at Southern Guild and present this magnificent piece by ZZ called Hay War. So Lee, one of my favorite aspects about this piece is that it talks about women's issue and also about what it means to be a woman in Africa. So Zizi, so nice to meet you. Lee, why did you select this piece? Because Zizi's top, that's why. Okay. And she's amazing. And I actually uh, have grown up with three sisters and I'm very conscious of women. And I'm a very, uh, it appealed to me greatly because I learned that this kind of idea that art imitates life and life imitates art, in this case, Zizi actually created these kind of memorial uh, hair, 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 traditional hairstyles based on great women. And this is an Egyptian woman. We actually have stills of her in this particular hair thing, but it's wonderful to have the artist next to her piece and see the relationship that she has to her piece. Completely. And I want to say that Zizi was wearing dozens of hair pieces mm -hmm. uh, during the time when she created this series of work. Mm -hmm. So Zizi, is this, how did you get all these hair ideas? Are these traditional? Yes, these are inspired by traditional African hairstyles. Um, I've looked up on, online and saw beautiful images uh, from way back in, in, in the early, uh, well, 1900s, but beautiful, beautiful work and um, hair artists that created this kind of works, yes. And I, I, I read that you started your career by making vessels, yes. by making things that are very functional, yes. but that you have really mastered the art of coiling by hand. Yes. But then you move to do pieces like that, that are very conceptual. Yes. And Lee, you love conceptual design. Well, I had a, I had a, 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 a technical question. Yeah. To create this thing that you did before you made the bronze, how long did it take to create that off the top of your head? About two months in total, because it includes a very long process of production from uh, building, constructing the work and letting it dry and firing it. So there's like different yeah, processes that it goes through. So a total of two months? From start to finish. From start to finish, yes. And is it one of a kind? One of a kind. So you're yes. not doing other stuff like that? No, you will never find any, anything like this, exactly like this. You can find something similar, inspired with, from the same series, but not the same. So Lee, do you see, do you envision this in one of your interiors? Well, I'm so proud to say that we have a fellow South African who's quite infamous. And the, um, I believe the show, something is, this goddess was about in flight, I think, right? Yes, it's, it's an Egyptian goddess uh, of the sky. Yes. And the wonderful recipient of this is also a master of the sky, as he was the first civilian to go to outer space. So it seems iconic and incredible that the first person to go to outer space has a celebrated piece oh my based God. on the Egyptian goddess. And this is your God. interior? Yes, it's a space in New York. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have South Africa in New York, okay. in the sky with ZZ. ZZ, thank you so much. Thank Good you. luck. Hi, I'm Julie Hillman. I'm an interior designer in New York. I selected a piece at the fair um, to talk about and it's Raphael Nouveau's fabulous sofa. Hi, Julie. Hi, Daniela. <laughs> Julie, have you ever used this sofa in your interiors? I sure have. I More sure than have. once? Yes. Why? Yes. Because it's a fabulous sofa. Um, it's like no other collectible sofa that I've ever found. It's, um, it's comfortable, first of all. So it's, comfortable. It's super My comfortable. God. Yeah. It's, the design of it is fabulous. Um, it can sit in the middle of a room and it, it, it's, it's like sculpture that you can sit on. Um, 
And I just think he's a genius. And I also think, Julie, that you interiors are very much defined by materials that are, first of all, colorless, but secondly, that are very luxurious and good. And I see that here, too. Well, this what is, is Laura, this it's Laura Piana Cashmere, oh, Teddy. Laura Piana what, Yes, it's Laura Piana. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible fabric, and just the fact that he chose that and the luxury but also the make of the piece, the, the it's, construction. It's like old world construction, what he did, um, which is did so you, rare. Do you know the artist Raphael yes, Nabot? Did yes, you I ever do. meet him in Paris? Yes, I did. What is it like, his he's, studio? He's, I just think he's a genius. He showed, before he was doing furniture, he showed me some things that he was working on and he's so multifaceted. Um, he, he does architecture, he was designing a wine bar, he designed a stairway. I mean, so when he started doing the furniture and I started seeing it, um, I was not surprised. I mean, he really can do anything. And these are just, these are really fabulous pieces. And do you use this, have you used it in living rooms or in sitting rooms, in what type so of So the first one I used is in a master bedroom, in a sitting room. Um, it's floating on the side of the bed, and you, from the bed you're looking at the back. So that was a difficult thing to find, and when this came out, it was perfect. So I bought this very early on, and then now I'm doing one in um, somebody's living room, and it's larger. But what's great about it is you can sit on all the components. Like, you can sit on the back, you can sit on the arms. Oh. So for socializing, it's, it's, it's a great like a piece. Like a socializing piece. Yeah. But you know that also I feel that Raphael's sofas became this fixture of today's interiors yep. that is very right for today's interiors because it has this, as you said, this three-dimensional yep. aspect to it. Yep. It also has this beautiful um, craftsmanship, French craftsmanship. So are you going to keep using? I am. You as long as he keeps designing, he did a pair of chairs that I purchased um, for off of somebody's kitchen. I actually purchased four of them. He's, he's fabulous. So I, I can't wait to see what he continues to do. Julie, thank you. You're welcome. I'm Alan Wansenberg. I'm an architect and a designer. And I um, chose this piece by Arthur Elrod uh, to really initiate a discussion about Arthur Elrod. Alan, you selected a distinctive piece with a very interesting narrative. So this desk was designed by Arthur Ellard, who was a Palm Springs, very famous and sort of social type of interior designer. And it was designed in the 60s. So why did you decide, why did you pick this piece? Well, uh, first off, it was a piece from Pace uh, that he modified with the hardware and with the color so it's actually a production piece that Arthur Elrod chose to uh, adjust, let's say, and make more specific for an interior he was doing for the Edelson family, which was a very uh, prominent family from New York, but also a very loyal client. Why? He did three homes for them. Yes. Yeah. Where? He did a, an apartment at the Pierre Hotel. He did uh, the the home in. Um, in uh, Palm Springs, and then he also did a home, I think more in the mountains, uh, but I could be wrong about that. But, but why I really brought it up was because I wanted to learn about uh, Arthur Elrod. I had been spending more time in Palm Springs. Uh, I have a place there now, a little tiny place there. I didn't tiny, know. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Well, okay. no one knows. He always says tiny, <laughs> and then it's not really tiny, but okay. But why I bring it up is because um, I think Arthur Elrod is one of these m m kind of uh, individuals that uh, it was, he's a catalyst. He's a catalyst. He, he, he grew up in rural South Carolina. He left when he, be he went to Clemson, which was more of a, a technical school, a trade school. And he learned, um, he studied textiles. So then from there, he went to uh, uh, a design school in Los Angeles. Then he went to San Francisco, and every place he went, he brought with himself all these different technical trades, like the, the history of textile, the knowledge of textiles. And then in San Francisco, he became more aware of the artists and art scene there. 
he was um, he used, for example, who was productive at that time in the in the in the 50s and late 40s, uh, uh, and then later in the 50s, Ruth Asawa, for example, Bertoya. So he was he was very current with art scene and things happening, but also he had this wonderful. He was very magnanimous, and he encouraged other designers. He encouraged other people around him, and he did his own work, but he did it in a very seamless way with other individuals. Um, a good example is uh, Rob Johns Gibbings, where he, he really, uh, the Whittacombe line that, that he called them Gibby, that Gibby produced, he used in all of his interiors. So he's a fascinating character because he was quite prolific at a young age. He produced a lot of work. He moved to Palm Springs. He became a very social, kind of eligible bachelor, as they say. Uh, he continued to travel. He became very professionalized about his career. He had numerous partners, and both in his career and in his life. Um, and uh, his house. And his, his house, house, his final home. It's like the most famous mid-century, not mid-century, 60s house in Palm Springs. In the late 60s. He, late he did a, a very important uh, collaboration with John Lautner. And he, he just let John Lautner uh, do the house that John Lautner thought he, he, he should do on that site. And he, he created, I think, an environment that's, uh, of course, it's very, it's very evocative. It was called the greatest, he w it was in Playboy magazine, and I mean, if you know anything about Arthur Elrod, and also in life, and it was also used in, um, I believe, Diamonds Are Forever. So it was yes. a set. Diamonds right. Are Forever, so 1971, in, uh, film. Sean Connery yeah. was filmed in his house. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons why um, Elrod has, I just finished, the, the book, by the way, is beautifully written by, um, Adele Siegelman, who mm -hmm. was an editor at at at, at um, yeah at at uh, AD, and uh, uh, she was my editor at AD as well. But also the great thing about uh, the connection with uh, AD is that Arthur Elrod, AD wasn't always the success that you imagine, and Arthur Elrod, with his Southern California sensibility, was someone who Paige Rents tapped into early on in her career at AD as well as. Um, his career where he was savvy about publicizing things. He worked for lots of celebrities. He built, um, he, sadly at the time of his death, he, he died at, in his late 40s in a very tragic uh, car accident. This is like not to believe him together with his assistant designer. They no, no, no. It was his, it was his partner. It oh, was uh, Bill partner. Razor who was at both. They lived together and they worked together and they were just going to the office in the morning and Somebody ran a red light and killed both of them immediately. It was tragic. Uh, and I think that's also why he's a little under the radar because the um, Steve Chase, who took over the business, and uh, his former uh, life partner, but you know, Broderick, they, they weren't so uh, convivial, but I think they kept the business going and they worked on the Bob Ho House. We have a guest here. So uh, if you ever, <laughs> if you go to Palm Springs, don't forget to at least look at this place. Yes. Sometimes it's open to the public. Yeah. Just in like very specific yeah. events. And also I think really, if I'm going to just sort of say a few things more in conclusion, I think what's brilliant about Elrod was he had the kind of confidence, he had the self-assurance to bring people into his practice. Uh, one of his um, early assistants, she went out and started on her own with, of all people, Hoagie Carmichael, and he took no umbrage at that. It didn't bother him. He was comfortable with that. So he clearly, while he grew up in sort of a hard scrabble existence, he quickly assumed the role of mentoring people, expanding his career, realizing that um, the, the, the uh, uh, proprietary nature of design is actually kind of a trivial concept, if you know what I mean. And so he, he uh, I think is someone who really should be celebrated for the generosity of spirit, the kind and, of uh, encouragement. And this booth certainly celebrates yes. Arthur El Elrod. Yeah, yeah, good. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Daniela O'Hart and I'm a design connoisseur. And I selected for this video to talk about a sofa by Ayala Sofrati, which is presented by Galerie BSL from Paris. Not as an Israeli, but I have selected a piece by Israeli designer Ayala Sofrati, which is called Anu, A 
and you. And the meaning of this word is us, is togetherness. And the reason that she called this sofa this way because do you see that it's made out of two leaves. And the idea is about, about harmony in relationship. This is what she has in mind when she decided to do this sofa. And she's been working a lot with the idea of relationships in her work as a designer. But I also decided to select it. First of all, this is the largest piece of furniture she's ever done. But the way that she works uh, with felt, she's molding a whole piece of felt made in fibers, in wool fibers, silk fibers, and linen fibers. She molds it in one piece over this sofa. So it's, of course, it's one of a kind. To make a sofa like this takes about six months. And think about it, she is importing fibers from all over the world that, were, that she's taking the fibers and she felt them with water. This is how you work with felt. And one of the reasons that she is so attracted to felt is because in the 80s she saw an exhibition by Joseph Boyce when she was a student in England, in London, and she fell in love with his work with how conceptual he was. But he also used a materiality that became very attractive to her. But Ayala Sarfati also is very connected to ancient cultures. So she's not about, she's a contemporary designer, but she's not about digital technologies or digital aesthetics. She's all about looking backwards to very ancient cultures. And if you look at felt, felt is really the most ancient, the earliest form of textile. And, and she, of course, took it to a whole different horizons. And this is why I selected that piece that is called Anu by Ayala Sarfati. I'm Rob Johansson. I'm an interior designer in New York. And I have selected Megan H to speak about today, specifically the incredible French designer and architect, Hervé Ballet. Hi, Rob. How are you? I'm good. You know, you selected one of my favorites. I'm, I'm very happy to have seen something that you love as well. Yeah. You know that when I first saw the furniture by Hervé Ballet with a Megan H gallery, when I first saw it, it was about three years ago, when they just discovered it. Right. So he was this architect who created very architectural furniture in simple modernist materials who was completely forgotten until now. So why did you select him? For many, many reasons. I think, first of all, he, he speaks of, you know, through design and art, really questioning and studying the higher divine question. What is life? Where is it coming from? Where do we find our geometry? And so he's really bringing organic geometry to a very simple, humble practice of design. His work is undeniably mystical and, and familiar and yet timeless. It, it, for me, it's, it's, he's an incredible designer and I'm so happy that he's front and center in this beautiful booth. And can you say something about the table? Because it's made in unusual material of cork. So and today cork has been very popular, especially by designers who work in Portugal. But when he worked with cork, it was more an architecture material. You know, Hervé studied at the Beaux Arts in Paris and his focus was really to go against the idea of modernism, the very like, strict sense of architecture, which was Corbusier, and instead wanted to really speak and design based on organic material, hence the pine or the oak that he uses, as well as the cork. And there's something about it where you're drawn to it. You feel, you know, it's, it has this beautiful poetry to it, and it's exquisite. Would you, would you use it in your interiors? I hope so. I actually, I would love for it to be in my own home. So, Rob, you know, you are known for working with very young, young collectors. 
Uh, that's your specialty. Yeah, you know, I, um, I myself am a millennial and a lot of my clients are millennials as well. And they're young collectors and they're really trying to see how do we, how do we build a collection in our early 30s and where do we start? And I really start from the very beginning of, you know, the history of design. Where does everything begin? What are, what are its origins? And um, I often find myself here at Megan H, really looking at beautiful pieces that are often gems in itself. And, and Hervé's work is exactly that. My name is Paul Cornett. I'm an architect based in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And I am here because I've selected a piece of Maxlam cliff chairs with gallery for me. Hi, Paul. How are you? Good. Very good. Thank you. You know, I look at these pieces. They are so beautiful. And Max Lamp is an, a designer who lives in London and he's very interested in materials and in a very different way of treating materials. That's what his signature. So the cle how did he make these chairs? So the clef chairs are actually made of a single log of tree that was harvested uh, near London. And the log was just uh, cut in several pieces with a small ax uh, to create the chairs. So eventually uh, you could put back the pieces together to form again the original log. And here the idea was that uh, after that uh, process, so the veins of the timber are highly visible through that process. And here they are coated with two types of leaves here in 25.3 carat gold leaves and these are uh, platinum leaves. So think about it. So he, the way that he used, he treats the wood. The wood is still raw and he clapped the wood. And, that, and what is really the advantage of this type of technique is that you can see the wood, no matter how he's covering. This is usually he does, he works with lacquer, but here he works with gold leaf and platinum. And you can see you can see the quality, you can see the texture of the wood. Nothing was, nothing was really lost. So why did you pick up these chairs? Well, I've been following the work of Max for a long time. I oh. think he's an iconic contemporary designer. Uh, as you said, his work on chairs is, is, uh, is one of a kind. And I'm very happy to see that these works are here, as are, that are, I think, settling Max as one of the you know, most important contemporary designer of our times. And you know, there is something about the way that he works with the, with the material that is so raw, right? Yeah. It's so raw, he like almost doesn't do anything with it. And he lets the material speak for itself. And it is so magical. So think about it, he took one log and he cut it into, he cleft it. He like split it into how many pieces here? This is one log and, log, and then he made those chairs. So would you use those in your interiors? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would definitely. <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, you know, like if we look at the history of 20th century design, it was really about comfort and shapes. And I think Max is this new generation that I, took us to the question of design in terms of processes, material resources, and questioning I think in a very interesting way, the rawness of the log of timber versus the, the plating that is made with, uh, with gold and, and platinum. And therefore questioning these questions, these traditional notions of furniture, what a chair can do, what a furniture can do. And, uh, and then I, I think that that's just uh, fantastic, you know, contemporary, contemporary designs, yeah. And it's very interesting that you speak about comfort because in contemporary design, we look at comfort in a very different way. We look at comfort as something that is so conceptual that it's comfort our spirit rather than comfortable in the more traditional way. So Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniela. I want to thank you all for joining me on this tour and I hope that you enjoyed it. And I also want to tell you that starting in February, we are opening a new series called Furniture Design The Legends. And I'm going to host 10 of those I feel the most important furniture designer working today. And I hope that he, to see you there as well. And I'm wishing you a great time in Miami. And thank you.